think um, it's good that we have the people here today, so I don't have to do too much uh, of a recap here. So I thought maybe what we would do um, is I wanted to do just real quick. Um, uh, again, let me write out here what the template basically is. We talked about this before. We talk about it pretty much every time. That that when Yeshua says that he's the one who basically walks amidst the seven golden lampstands, walks amidst the seven churches, in other words, that that is metaphorically, in terms of metaphoric space, that is him in the church age, you know, making observations of different times and places within that church age and creating a framework upon which to write the seven letters or whatever. We have, uh, again, the first church is the church of Ephesus or whatever. And if you, if you read... Um, what he says about them and their works, you'll notice that if just on the surface of it, these people seem like they're really, really good Christians, like really straight up good Christians. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and thou canst not bear them which are evil, and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. So they're discerning, right? They're, they're, they're fighters, they're out there, you know, I mean, so these are good people, right? They do have a rebuke. It says that thou hast borne and thou hast patience, and for my name's sake thou hast labored and not fainted. So they're tireless people. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So this is just to underscore the fact that you can do everything right, right? But if you don't have that first thing, if you don't have that love of the knowledge, if you don't have the love of the truth, right, you're going to fall from that, that grace that you had right in that knowledge right so these people lost sight of what was most central in christianity and so therefore they kind of fell again he, he mentions that also he says remember therefore from whence thou art fallen right and repent right so in other words how do you fall you fall from something higher to something lower right so if you're if you have a higher level understanding of the scriptures if you can read deeply into them in other words and you can recognize the heavenly language in other words you hear his voice let them have that have ears let him hear you know what i'm saying the idea is that you're hearing on a spiritual thing so what they've fallen from is the spiritual level probably in no small part they probably got drawn into fighting for you know the truth and fighting these apostles and probably got dragged down into their arguments and to their level and, and fighting them all the time, they, they may just have lost their focus and just lost sight of that. So these, these, this particular church, if you want to call it the first church, seems to have fallen from a higher level understanding. That, and again, what I'm trying to, to, to create is that the Catholic letters or the general epistles, in other words, as they're sometimes called, often... If, if you read through them, there's this underlying theme of this, the, the attack against the teachings, the attack against the apostles. You can really see the, 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 the idea that Satan is really fighting something here. He's fighting the apostles. He's got, he's got some kind of motivation to keep them and their teachings down. Um, and it talks about in Second Peter, for example... Um, that, you know, if you remember his words or whatever, that, that you will not fall, right? So the idea is that, um, that, um, that what Jude and um, Peter coming together is kind of teaching us is that there's these people infiltrating the church, that they're subverting the truth. And he speaks about them in the most derogatory ways. You know, he talks about the, the dog returns to his vomit and the swine, the sow. That, you know what I'm saying? He's calling these people dogs and swine and other unclean things. You know what I'm saying? So he speaks very harshly against them. Um, and that's because they're coming into the church and they're subverting the truth. And what are the, what are the, what are the truths that they are subverting? Well, one of the things that you can tell structurally about it from Jude and Enoch's approach is that Jude and Enoch bring up these apocryphal books that we know subsequent Christians have rejected and denigrated. You mean uh... Jude and Second Peter. Jude and Second Peter. What did I say? I said Jude and Enoch. Oh well, yeah, I get those conflated sometimes. But anyways, but you know what I'm saying. But in the, in using Enoch, you know, Jude lays himself open to people who might be critical of that book, right? He kind of sticks his neck out for it. And why does he make those those statements about it? Like why does he why does he again so strictly affirm that he cites the source, right? Terrible. Okay. 
this is the source, right? That he's the seventh from Adam, right? So that's again his antiquity, right? Um, that he prophesied, right? That he's a prophet about these men, the infiltrators, right? That so that it is relevant to his age, right? So it's not just something that was over with during the flood, right? And then the quote that he quotes, right, is the same quote as we have in the book of Enoch. So we can identify the source by name, right? So what Jude might as well be saying is, look, the book of Enoch is ancient. The book of Enoch is prophetic. The book of Enoch bears on our age and the people who are infiltrating our church, right? And that the quote has to do with the Lord's coming. So it will be relevant at the time of the Lord's coming. The, the piece that you can add to this from Enoch is that Enoch says in chapter 1, Right? The very first thing it says, and again, the quote is from chapter 1, Enoch 1, 9, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000. So that's the concluding section of that first chapter. So if he's read all the way down to verse 9, I think it can be presumed that he's read, you know, 1 through 9, right? The idea is that the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation. Again, the Lord cometh, right? When the wicked and the God will sort of be removed, Right? We will be living in the, in, the, in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless sort of be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were open, my God saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, and blah, blah, blah. And it goes all the way down to, um, and it says that, but it's not for this age, but it is for an age to come. It's for the time of the removal of the... So in other words, you're going to have Enoch taken out of circulation, right, and returned at some point. So here within the confines of just about everybody's canon, Almost. What was that church you said that didn't doesn't formally accept them? Is it the uh, the Assyrian Church of the East? Okay. So in other words, but virtually every canon has Jude in it right. and Second Peter. Okay. So virtually every. So in other words, if there if these two form a mechanism whereby the statement can be made that this book of Enoch, which is this book because the quote matches, right? So yeah, he's covered that base, right? This is that, all right? That it bears on his age and the age to come, so it's still relevant. So he's verified him in that. That he says that he prophesied, therefore it is prophetic, right? So the book is prophetic, right? He's vouching for its antiquity. You can see the the, the critics saying this is not ancient, this is not credible. He, that's what they're saying now. The whole reason that it's in a book called Pseudepigrapha is that word pseudepigraphy means false writings, falsely attributed writings. So our, our current understanding of these books is that they are fables, that they are fake books. That's our current Christian understanding. So we're saying he's affirming that they're, that they're ancient, right? And of course, he's not afraid to name the source by name. So this book is ancient, prophetic, that is relevant to their age and is relevant to the age to come. Th this is literally what Jude is saying. And we see almost incontrovertible evidence that this book was brought before Peter because Jude makes apostolic claims. He says that this was something that the apostles taught, right? So it's not just him, he's not just a one-off, right? He says to fight for the faith, right? So evidently this book is brought before Peter. Evidently this book is brought before Peter with certain questions. And the questions are obviously derived from the answers. The answers are, we did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord. Again, the Lord cometh with, that's the coming, ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment, that's the power, right? So this is not, so Peter is saying, this is not a cleverly concocted fable, right? So what you get is that the people who are opposing the, this book, are also opposing Jude, are also opposing Peter, right? So you can, you can just logically deduce, like you don't have to even be a Christian to make that logical conclusion. Christians have a tendency to negate this stuff because we, we rationalize. We start with the conclusion that the canon is right, and we work backwards from that. 
We say because there's only these 66 books or whatever it is that's in your canon, right? And Enoch lies outside of that. The decision has been made. The, it's fixed in stone, so to speak, right? Anything outside of that is questionable at best. You know what I'm saying? And Christians don't, don't accept it. The idea is that this is brought before Peter, all right? And this is what we see. Now, again, what, what are the questions that he addresses? We talked about when he says that the, we weren't following cleverly concocted fables when we were telling. So he, obviously people are saying that this is a cleverly concocted fable, which makes sense because they're still saying it's a cleverly concocted fable. They're calling it a suit of pigger font, right? So in other words, everything that Jude is affirming, man is denying. Let God be true and every man a liar, right? So in other words, it, is the way forward in Christianity going to be this constant negation of what is there based on the idea of the canon. The canon has, is, is a forced idea that is from the top down and from the outside in, right? The idea is that it's manufactured, like literally created by men, so that by negating Enoch, you're also negating everything that Jude is saying and basically everything that Peter is saying as well in the process. So this is where we're at, right? So if these things are true, right, and they can be shown to be true, all right, then what is the direction that the church is taking? Well, clearly, what, I, what I'm talking about here is clearly not what the church has been saying all along. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a negation, if you will, of Jude and Peter. And so the idea is that this clearly was lost, right? So this could easily be from where they have fallen. They have fallen from the state where they can affirm what the apostles believed. And now they can't do it. Because what the apostles believed is something that was negated. Right? So now they've fallen from that. Now the next church is the uh, church of Smyrna. Right? So they're the ones who, um, how should I say, Okay, let me just read it. It says, under the, the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, um, th write these things. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Again, uh, you don't have to be in a, in a super duper rich church or whatever to have the church, you know, to have the, the truth. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's been said about this particular congregation and any one of us could stand up and, and teach, which I think is true. You know, a lot of this is kind of us preaching to the choir, but, you know, of course, we obviously have the extended audience that we're preaching to. Uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't require wealth in order to have the truth, because the truth is the true wealth. And, if, and, 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 and the underlying message of these books is that by chasing after the world and by chasing after worldly wealth, right, that the truth gets lost and that we fall from the original understanding because we're looking for consensus, we're looking for agreement, you know, we're looking for, you know, uh, go, you got to go along to get along or whatever. And that's essentially what the canon is. It's a consensus. And so we live in a consensus reality. We all agreed to be Christians in this building. We've all agreed to the 66 books by being Protestant or whatever. And if you happen to be Catholic and there's 70 odd books in that, you happen to agree on that. Or, you know, if you happen to be Armenian or whatever, and you only agree on 25 or 24 out of the 27 books or whatever, you've just agreed to that. It's all consensus. So it's all subjective. It's subject to men's thinking, right? And so that's the trap. The idea is that the canon eliminate, or limits your thoughts to what's inside of this box. And so when things outside of that box get mentioned, they also get negated. You have to say, like, how many times... Have we read the uh, the disclaimers? If you follow the notes in Jude 14 and 15, for example, and you happen to have a you know a somewhat more scholarly Bible with footnotes, if they're going to mention it at all, generally speaking, they're going to be very dry about it. They're going to just say very categorically, for example, 
you know, uh, quoted from the non-canonical book of Enoch 1.9 or something. I think I read that one one time. And I've read other ones, too, that's like, oh, well, just because he mentions this doesn't mean the whole book is, you know, inspired or whatever. But, I mean, he clearly, he clearly is saying it's ancient when scholars are saying it's not. He's clearly saying it's prophetic when Christians are saying it's not. He's clearly in dis We are clearly at variance with what he's saying. And what I'm saying is this is what's happened to the church. This is how we've fallen. Right? And the Bible spells it out because it leaves enough information here for you to glean this if you just look at it and believe it. Right? All you have to do is go along with what they're saying. All you have to do is read what is there. And you will come to an entirely different conclusion than what you're taught. So, um, again, so this is where you get the first mention of the synagogue of Satan. This is where you start seeing um, Satan mentioned. There's a sort of a satanic arch art in here that I've been trying to get to, but I want to establish everything kind of first, and so now, so the idea is that with these guys, you have the first mention of the synagogue of Satan. Which which city is that? Um, Smyrna. So Smyrna is mentioned there, synagogue of Satan. Yeah, the, 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 the first thing he says, um, yeah, it says, I know that works, thy tribulation and thy poverty, right? They're the poor church, but they're also rich. They're poor in this world. Because they're rich in the scriptures. I mean, uh, presumably, they're not looking at that. They're not going for the numbers. They're not looking for just butts and seats. They're looking for, you know, the, the truth, right? So he's like, uh, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So there's a couple of things you'll notice. Satan has a couple of things. Satan has a synagogue. What is it? He has a seat, right? The seat of Satan or the throne of Satan. That's in Pergamum. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the things that are centered around Satan and his right. heart, right? And then he also has the the depths, deep things of Satan. Still all right? Okay. So, just parenthetically, Satan has those things. Is there anything else? So he's mentioned? got a seat, he's got deep things, and he's got a uh, synagogue. Yeah. So, in other words, that's his attack. Claims to be the right. To, like I said, this is you can look it up online, but it's very fascinating how <clears throat> in in Berlin. I mentioned this before, but you had this this huge temple, and I saw it because uh, my brother lives in Germany now. We went over his, his uh, uh, wedding over there, and so we spent some time went to Berlin, and they actually have the what they think was this, it's it's this temple that looks like a throne. They think that was the, the synagogue of Satan. And what happened is, I guess you had the Ottoman Empire as the old man of Europe, and so they just took it apart and they reassembled it in this. Uh, uh, Museum in, in Berlin. Huh. So it's the, the weird thing is, it's like some people are arguing that that is a satanic, you know, that it's, it's what the Bible called this, the, the, uh, the, the throne of Satan. And apparently the, the Nazis tried to create a gigantic, you know, inspired by that building, one of their big, you know, parade grounds was uh, based on that. So anyway, obviously okay. what the Nazis do is satanic anyway. So, okay, so. What presumably would Satan be doing? What would be like one of his approaches? Like with these guys, for example, here, one of the things that that um, that Jude and Peter talk about quite a bit is remembrance. That implies a forgetting. That implies a falling away, right. Right? right? And so, what is his advice to Ephesus here? Remember, right? Therefore, from which you have fallen. So, one of the depths of Satan would be to tell them to forget, right? He's telling these guys to forget, right? Of course, he's telling these guys, uh, I'm going to lock you up. Put you in prison, and I'm going to give you tribulation, right? And then, of course, as this moves on, of course, as we see as it uh, <laughs> moves on to Pergamos, right? He's like, die, <laughs> you know, um, to the Pergamos, right? So, in other words, these guys, and this is another thing too, these are the guys that don't have any rebukes at all. And it talks about um, that if they're faithful unto death, right, again, they're going to be locked up, they're going to be given tribulation, and then they're asked to be faithful unto death, right? So that's his approach to this church, right? But they have a crown because they haven't given in, because presumably they were faithful unto death, right? So they didn't forget, right? They stood up to him, and they paid the ultimate price. And this kind of goes on for a little while in the Church of Pergamos, which is basically the formative church, 
right? Um, and so let's read that. Um, it says, To the angel of the church of Pergamos, these things saith he that hath the, sar the sharp sword with two edges. And again, what is the sword? It's his word, right? I have the, the word of God is, sharp, is a is sharper than any two-edged so, sword. So when, when uh, John saw you, Jesus, Yeshua, he appeared to him in glorified form, right? He's like uh, transfigured. He's standing between the, the menorah, and a sword comes out of his mouth, right? This is the beginning of it. Right, and the sword, the, the sharper the two-edged sword, that's the separation between soul and spirit, right? Which is the, the two ways of thinking. Right. The the depths of Satan are the soul and the the, the mind and the, you know the heart of men and the thoughts of men and whatnot. Right. Whereas the depths of God or whatever are the higher understanding. You know, let's say. Uh, it says, "I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is." So at this point, Satan has basically in, enthroned himself, if you will. You know, he's got his own little seat that he's upon because now he's comfortable. He's comfortable enough to where he can be like again. It was given to him to make war against the saints, right? So again, at this point, he can make war against the saints, right? But these guys were faithful unto death. So in other words, they preserved the mystery, right? In other words, the the mystery is preserved in them. And he says um, that thou um, that the hold, holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith, even where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Right. So at this point, the any any vestiges of the true church, the one that Satan isn't absolutely in control of, are gone. And this basically marks his total power and total control. He can just kill at will. Right. And that's that's what's happening to the people of Pergamos. Now it's interesting that that he mentions the name um, uh, Antipas. Now, either a name means something or it doesn't. We talked about Nicolaitans, right? How helpful it was to understand what that meant because it, 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 whether it's true or not, it's consistent, right? And I'll put it that way. Uh, the idea that um, the that the name um, Antipas basically means. Right, anti means anti, right? Against, right? And pass means everything, right? So in other words, the one that they killed was against all of that, right? He was against all of man's teaching, maybe. But that's what that main that name means. So if there's any credibility at all to that, and again, there's either there is or there's not. You know, I mean, that's up to you. But the idea is that he opposed all that was going on, if that's the case. And where that riffs, I think, off of the scriptures is where it says, let God be true and every man a liar. Because in a lot of ways, we're called to be against everything that came before us. All of the, I mean, if, if there's any truth to this notion that this truth was lost and then later given, restored and given back or whatever, that means that all of this, this intervening stuff or whatever basically is get pulled out by the roots. And so in other words, um, you have to be against everything. Let God be true and every man a liar in order to let God be true, in other words, right? I guess is what I'm trying to get from that. Um, I'm sorry, what, where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm in Pergamos. Um, Seven letters of Revelation? Yeah, yeah. And um, it says, okay, um, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of the Lamb, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Um, and thou also hast them there that hold the doctrine unto the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Right? So. The Nicolaitans are here, right, in the Church of Ephesus, and they're also here in the Church of Pergamos. Uh, so, in other words, the, 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 the people who are drawing away from the apostles and the authorities, which is what Nicolaitans means, Nico means conquering, and laity means people, right, that the, that the people are still trying to conquer the people. And that kind of makes sense when you still have people like Antipas around, you know, that, that they're, they're still against the original apostolic teaching that presumably Antipas was holding, and get, in other words, let God be true and every man a liar, or at least that he was faithful, you know, if you just want to take it at that. 
Um, and it says, repent or else I will come to thee quickly and f uh, fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Right? Again, he identifies himself as having the sharp two-edged sword, right? Um, and he let he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. Right? Well, okay, so, first of all, in the Ark of the Covenant, right, you had the tables of the law, right? And then you had Aaron's rod, And then you had the hidden manna. Right? Um, and that corresponds with what we've been over this before. That this sort of represents the, the three things, right? There's, there's Christianity, there's the Old Testament, let's say, there's the New Testament, let's say, and then there's one to come, right? The third revelation, if you will. Um, what is to come? That's why you see this in the future tense, right? Because Aaron's rod, again, it undergoes a transformation. It goes from just being a rod to being tested overnight. So this is a metaphorical night, right? And then it bears, you know, branches and fruits and all this other, you know, from it. So it go, undergoes a transformation. So the idea is that the scriptures then, because that's our rod, that's our canon, in other words, cane and rod are related terms, right? So the idea is that our canon blossoms, right? The fruit appears, the fruit of knowledge, right? And then, of course, we're ready to move on to eat of the, that which was hidden from us, the manna, the food that you know not of. My father has food to eat that you know not of. That's the hidden manna, right? So the scriptures that we have that we don't know about, such as Enoch and all that, that that's all held in reserve for us, right? So if you overcome, right, then you will get to eat of that, which makes sense in that context, right? And it says, um, and I will give him a white stone. And again, um, there's, again, if we consider that this is a stone and that this is a stone and that this is a stone, let's say, uh, again, you see at the, at the temptation where the devil says, okay, take these stones and make them bread, right? The idea is that you're taking what is not edible, which is to say the, the scriptures in, in the fleshly form are not the spiritual food that they are when they're transformed. So again, it's kind of the transformation. You're taking from something that's barren and, and making it fruitful. You can't eat the, the rod, but you can eat the fruit. You see what I'm saying? The idea is that you're going from non-edible to edible. So the idea is that now you're given this third dispensation, if you will, right? Even Yeshua himself is compared to a rock or a stone. You know, uh, the idea is that he is the Logos, he is the Word of God, he is the door. There's a lot of metaphors that apply to him, but they all boil down to him. And he is it, and they are them, or they, they are him. Um, and there's the new name, right? Again, he's talking about them. I will give them a name, right? So, in other words, he's talking about them before. He's naming them, right? So he's calling out their existence. I have sheep to eat that are to come, which are not of this fold. He's naming them. You see what I'm saying? Uh, they will hear my voice. They will hear my language. You see what I'm saying? He's talking about them. So they are named, right? So if you accept it, nobody has it unless you accept it, right? It says that, yeah, no one has, knows even unless they receive it, right? And see, the, the doorway to this knowledge is to let God be true and every man a liar, to oppose every doctrine of man, right? And in a way to be the faithful witness, to be antipass, in other words. The idea is that you, that you stand in the face of all of that, right? And you're faithful to the end, and therefore, you know, like these guys, eventually you'll be given your crown of life too, right? Because he speaks to the churches, not, all, not just one. And he says, okay, we're moving on. To the, angel, uh, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? These things say that the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass, uh, I know their works, their charity, their service, and their faith, and their patience, and their works, and the last to be more than the first. Uh, again, because in the church of Thyatira, right, this is, this is what it basically amounts to the, the, the time of the Catholic church. Like, this is a formative church, right, where some of the martyrdoms take place over here until those guys are all gone. And then what's left or whatever, because you still have the Nicolaitans at this point, right? They're just going from bad to worse. 
And so here what you have is the idea is that if this is, represents the Catholic, Orthodox, or whatever, sort of the, 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 the first church where you have the real top-down power, the real outside in, where they actually declare a canon and it's very formal and stuff like that, it's not you know, just in flux, it's actually moved to that point where it's become very formal. And some of the things that are going on in that church, even though, yes, they are doing work, because technically they're pushing the Bible out there, or you know, at least the Catholic Church, you know, um, and so they're, they're going out to the ends of the earth or whatever, spreading this. But despite all that, there's a little bit, there's something a little bit rotten there because now they have that woman Jezebel, which again, in the book of Revelation, the great whore of Babylon is likened to the city of Babylon. It says the great the woman is the city. So it conflates the two. Um, and if you take Jezebel to be the false prophetess, if you will, that exists within Christianity, and she is the Christian counterpart to the great whore of Babylon, right? If that should be the case, that should be the understanding, then the idea is that, that this church basically is Babylon, you know what I'm saying, at least as far as the way that, um, the way that they're submitting to the, the, the words of this prophetess. And she encourages them to uh, commit adultery, uh, sexual sin, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And again, what is our food? It's our spiritual food. So if, if you believe the Bible, right, but you're also confined to the canon, right, such that even if you want to read this over here, you are permit, you're not permitted to. So even if it says the book of Enoch is ancient and prophetic and uh, that it bears on the age to come, you're still prohibited from reading it in the church and standing on it and affirming it Right. Even if you talk about it, you're persecuted. Right. So even if the food you eat, such as Second Peter and Jude, right, if, even if you eat that, if it's sacrificed to this idol of the canon, in other words, the canon is men limiting what God is saying, in effect, right, mm -hmm. and so you can't move outside of that box or whatever, <coughs> then you see the metaphorical prison, for example, that the Smyrnians were given, and you see the metaphorical um, chains, if you will, but that's the food that's sacrificed to the idol of the canon. You see what I'm saying? Now you can't, you can't go there. You see what I'm saying? They prevented you. So just that act has limited you, right? And it says, and behold, I will, ca um, yeah, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And again, who is our true husband? It's Christ, right? So when you have the, the fake father, if you will, that's adultery. You see what I'm saying? You don't have the real... You don't have the real deal. You're, 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 you have, you're the earthly counterpart. And so when you regard that person as your source, right, then that's the spiritual adultery. Right. Um, and it says, Behold, I will cast her into bed, that, and the men that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. So, right, so who's next, right? After Thyatira, um, there's Sardis, right? And we talked about, okay, so, our, okay, children, right? So, if these are the Protestants, right, and we were talking about this earlier, how they're sort of an offshoot, they're sort of a reaction against Catholicism. It's sort of like, um, we're just, we're just, you know, we're, we're rebelling against Catholicism, let's say. But it says, I'll kill our children with death. Right? So what is death? I mean, we read in the Gospel of Thomas, whoever comes to understand the meaning of these words will not taste of death, right? So death is a function of not understanding his words. So you come to life, in other words, by understanding. So the idea is that understanding brings life, not understanding brings death, right? So since you understand these things and now have eyes to hear and ears, you have this direct thing where you have a relationship with the Logos and you don't need some intermediary to explain it to you. Right? You don't have somebody to tell you that this is in, this is out, this, this is right, this is wrong. You can see it with your own eyes, with your own ear. Right? Um, and I will kill her children with death, and the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I will give each one of you according to your works. Again, he searches them out because he has the eyes like a flame of fire, right? like it says before. Right? So the idea is that these are the fiery trials. Right? He's watching you with his eyes that are putting you on trial, in other words. Um, so, but he says you have a reputation that you were alive, right? Just like the illusion of wealth, the illusion of, of, of life, right? But you're not, you're dead, 
right? So they've killed the children with death, so these are their children, right? So they're dead. They have a reputation for being alive, but they're not. He says, I know thy work. Um, yeah, that thou, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, but thou art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Well, what remained to them, right? The Catholics had the Apocrypha, right? They had that, at least. That was what they were left with, right? And then that got passed down to the Protestants, right? And he was saying, look, at least keep that, right? At least be faithful in that, right? But, of course, they didn't because we know that they nixed that. They got rid of it, right? So, um, yeah, it says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. So that instead of strengthening them, they got rid of them. Um, and the things which are ready to die. Again, the scriptures that were ready to die. Um, they were on the bubble. They were questionable at the time, in other words. Um, remember, therefore, how thou hast received, right? They received that and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if thou wilt not watch, I will come upon thee like a thief, right? Again, these books will be taken away from them in that knowledge, and I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then we get to the church of Philadelphia. All right. I know I'm running along here, but I'm trying to make it quick. So we talked about what the Church of Philadelphia write. It was one of two churches that did not have a review. Smyrnia did not have a review. Apparently they didn't do anything that was worthy of a review in, um, in these letters. And neither did Philadelphia. He says, These things saith he that is holy and he that is true. So if you come to understand that he's true, in other words, what we say, that he that when he says that Enoch was ancient, he's a prophet or whatever, we understand that that's true. And we understand that the holiness of his words or whatever, right? Then that's sort of kind of the recovery. He that um, hold the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Again, that's like a door, and the door is like the scriptures. And Yeshua even says that about himself, I am the door, right? Um, so the idea is that now the door that was shut by these people, Right? That is to say, the door to these other scriptures that was shut by the canon, that was shut by their authority, right? Now that's been opened, right? Right? And there's no, and so now you follow the Lamb wherever He goes. If He says this book is in, right, then it's in. See what I'm saying? Because you're, you're going there, right? <clears throat> So these people have the ability to recognize the open door, right? So now that's the recovery of the mystery. So that's why they're next to last, right? Because they have to precede those that they teach, right? <coughs> so they have the, the key of David. So you can open up the scriptures, in other words, and recognize that they were shut. Remember Peter, right? Peter was given the keys, right? So that what he bound... On, on earth would be bound in heaven, and what he loosed in heaven would be would be bound on earth. So you get to heaven and earth, right? And then Peter talks about, I want you to recall the words that were spoken in the past by the holy prophets, those of you who come to a like faith as what we had, in other words, by, me, by way of remembrance. In other words, there's going to be a falling away and a forgetting, but then you'll remember, right? That's That was the key, and that was why it makes sense that Jude was brought before Peter, because by not answering the question directly by, by bringing it by way of remembrance, right, then it, could be, then it could be forgotten and then restored, just like the Book of Enoch would be forgotten and then restored, right? The idea is that it's lost and found, right? So that's the key. So Peter held that key and still holds that key to this day as a light that shines in a dark place, right? Which we live in an age of darkness, right? Um, Amen. And it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, Again, they're canonizers, right? That was that was what the Jew, that was what the official, you know, scribes and Pharisees and whatever, they all had a canon, you know. And we all know how much Jesus loved the establishment there. Um, and I will make them come and worship before thy feet. Why? Well, again, the synagogue of Satan was sort of triumphant over here, if you want to call being set up to fail triumphant, right? They were they were triumphant over here, but they're not over here. They don't have any power here, right? 
And that these guys, the synagogue of Satan, right, they're going to come and worship at their feet, right? So they've come full circle. Their ark is, is done, right? Their time is through. Is their usefulness is more, right yeah. So it says, um, Behold, I will come, make them come and worship before they feet, and know that I have loved thee, right? Because that makes sense. Understand that he saved the truth for the end, the good wine until the end, right? Because thou hast kept the word of my patient, right? Instead of throwing it out. Right? Instead of denying it, right? I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which is this, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Again, earthly teachings. You see that all throughout Revelation. Earthly teachings, right? Those who dwell on the earth, the vine of the earth, right? Right? Instead of the true vine, which is the, the vine of heaven, right? There's a contrast there, right? Even Thomas says that the vine has been planted outside of the Father, but being uh, unsound, it will be pulled up by its roots, right? So the, it's, it's designed to, dwell, to try people that dwell on the earth. Um, and it says, I come quickly, hold fast to what thou hast, that no man might take thy crown. So see how these had a crown, right? And a trial, right? These guys have a crown. Right? But no trial. In other words, he's made it easy for him. Right? It says, Him that overcome will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And we talked about that before, that there were three pillars. There was James, Peter, and John. Right? And that was a pillar. That was a pillar. And that was a pillar. Right? Again, that falls again under the pattern of what is. Right? He's our true high priest. Right? Our heavenly high priest. That's what is. Right? Peter is number one disciple. You know, I love you more than everyone else. Right? James, uh, again, between the idea of it being, um, like this is Moses, for example, the transfiguration, um, and Yeshua was at the transfiguration, and of course Elijah was at the transfiguration. Again, Elijah is to come and set all things right. See how it is to come, right? Yeshua then was, Moses was the past. So again, that follows the is, the was, and the is to come pattern. Right? So you see that throughout the scriptures here. Um, and it says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So that will be the third revelation. And again, we talked about that in, the, in terms of the construction of the building, right, in the book of Revelation, right, that there was the entrances, if you will, of the um, patriarchs. And then, of course, the foundations laid by the apostles. And of course, the walls, they correspond to 144. That's the 144,000 significance of that. That has to do with the elect, right? That's their new name, right? They're the elect of God. They've given that uh, throughout the scriptures. And I'll write, I'll write upon him my I new thought name. That was, I thought that was the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, hey, everybody's going to say it. Everybody's going to say it. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe they are the 144,000. Okay, so these guys are given an open door. Right? So again, just how we see death here and death here, crown here and crown here, there's all these touchstones, there's all these relationships here. The morning star, again, we talk about the morning star here, right? We talk about the lamb, lamb here. There's touchstones, right? You go and you fill those out. So again, this is our favorite church here, of course, the Laodiceans, right? Which is, of course, the church that these guys have to convert, have to preach to. And it almost says that here, it practically does. It says, the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, right? In other words, the true. It is so. The, the faithful and true witness. Again, because they have a means of understanding it is true. They have a means of understanding that it is faithful because these guys are preaching to them, right? And um, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish that thou art cold or hot. In other words, can I get to you by reason? Do you care? Right? Do you have any kind of do you have any kind of way of me, you know, the truth getting to you? So because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, right? Because he's not he can't stand the indifference or whatever that's holding the truth back. Because thou sayest I am rich. Again, they've gone chasing after the world. So they think they're rich, right? You see the mega churches, there's some not around here, mm. right? And increased with goods, and I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Why? Because they don't have the truth. They don't have that knowledge. They don't have the ability to say, Jude calls him ancient, he calls him a prophet. They don't have the ability to agree with God. They don't have the ability to agree with him. And so they're poor, spiritually, right? I counsel thee to buy from me gold 
um, tried in the fire. Again, the fiery trials, right? All of this stuff was to illustrate at the end of time that he has power over time, right? And he has power to keep the wicked until the day of judgment while preserving the righteous, right? And that's a, an actual demonstration of this, right? Um, and he says, you, you know that you're not, um, that you're wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked, right? Because they don't have the spiritual truth. Buy for me gold and uh, test in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Again, whoever overcomes will be given to walk in white, right? In other words, they'll be the bride of Christ if they, if they obey, right? That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see, right? So in other words, they want the, op the, do the open door of the scriptures to be visible to them, right? So that they can see what's there, right? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Again, right, if you're not chasten, then you're a bastard, right? You're not a, sorry, but you know what I'm saying? You're not you're an actual child. Um, it says, behold, I stand at the door, right? Because they've been given the open door. They've showed them the open door. They've showed them, hey, look, this is amen. This is true, right? I'm giving you this open door. So he's talking about the open door again. It says that I will come in with him and sup with him, right? They're going to eat what? Of the scriptures that are given to them, right? That's the new stone, right? And to him that overcometh will I get give to sit with me in my throne. So Satan's throne now been destroyed, and now God's throne is there. Um, even as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne, right? Because, again, he spoke and then he rested. He spoke and then he rested, and these people entered upon their rest and their labors, right? Um and that's about it. And then it says after this that the door was open in heaven, right? And then he saw things after that. But that's kind of the, the, the basic conclusion. I mean, I don't know if you want to hear more about this or if we want to move on to different topics next time or whatever. Um, would, but yeah. that's kind of just a basic read-through of it, just kind of, kind of a, you if know. If you feel there's more that we should know about this, then I'm open to hearing more about this. But... Um, there, there, there's always going to be coming back to this because everything interrelates. So, you know, so even if we move Enoch, on to different talk and maybe, topics. So maybe we kind of go into Enoch then? We could. Yeah. I we would could. like to go into Enoch and we could yeah, talk yeah. about it. So, 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 so that would be awesome.